thank you, Carmen, for introducing me. Um, so what I will do in this 30 minutes is to, de to develop with you a thought about transparency. I will link it to the practice of Workspace Brussels, uh, Workspace in Brussels, and to the Japanese exhibition that we made. And meanwhile, I will, I will keep things also concrete. Uh, so I will talk a lot about the artistic practices and the artists that are currently working in, uh, in Workspace. So we will see a lot of interesting uh, artworks on the way. But first, I would like to start with an imagination exercise. So I would like that everybody closes his eyes and I will give you something to imagine. Imagine that you're in a labyrinth. It's a vast labyrinth, it's a shady labyrinth. And all the walls are made of this thin mirror foil. You know, this mirror foil, it reflects yourself if you're in front of it, except if the light comes from the other side, then it becomes transparent. You can walk through the, through, through the many corridors. There is very little light and the light is constantly shifting. It's moving from space, from place to place. You walk freely around and many others like you cross your path, sometimes in the same corridor, sometimes behind the thin film walls. In the center of the space, you see a bigger wall, a reflecting bigger wall, and your attention is drawn towards it. You walk to this bigger wall and you see yourself reflected in the mirror. The light comes from your back. Then the light shifts and comes from the other end of this wall. And very gradually you start seeing the wall becomes transparent and you start seeing somebody else at the other side of the wall and your reflection disappears totally. In the end, the light moves back and it stays in between. So what you see in the film is both reflection of yourself and a shade of the person who is standing behind it. That's it. What I just described to you is a performance installation that exists, but it's impossible to film. Uh, it's a performance installation by Andro Sins Brown. He's a Brussels choreographer and Erki de Vries, an Antwerp-based uh, visual artist. And for me, this was the first image that came to mind when I was asked to give a talk about transparency. It's a very intuitive association. Then, of course, I started thinking more about uh, these thematics. And more rational associations that came up were uh, about bookkeeping. When I thought about transparency, I thought about a bookkeeping, like a transparent bookkeeping. What does that mean? That is um, a functional, very readable uh, yeah, bookkeeping. Or I thought about uh, policy, like transparent policy. These are like words that I associate with transparency. I also had to think about um, modern corporate architecture, you know, these very straight buildings made of glass and steel that have the impression of being very transparent. You can look straight inside and you can see all the productivity inside. So the transparency on the other end of the spectrum for me is linked to functionality, efficiency, but also control and power. I know it's also linked to some kind of ideal. It's a quite uh, political correct uh, topic. And it has to do with clarity. So for me, it has really two sides. Uh, I will give you an example. So beneath, we see the uh, Palais de Justice of uh, Ghent, so the Justice, uh, the Palace of Justice. And above, we see the one of Brussels. The one of Brussels, you all know, is a very uh, imposing building. It's very uh, big when you enter the staircase in the middle. You feel really subjected. It's uh, built to impose. On top of the huge dome, you have the crown, so it's very clear uh, who is in charge and uh, how the roles are divided, like the king and the state is in charge and you are really a subject. 
This was built around 1860, 1870, so 150 years ago. 150 years later, we have the um, um, Palais de Justice of Ghent, which is totally in this corporate, modern, uh, transparent architecture. Uh, uh, nowadays, um, we're not a real subject anymore. We became users of a space, and we became all customers, and the customer is king. So we are given like an impression of transparency. What I think is interesting about this uh, second building is that, in a way, for me, it's as opaque and as obscure as the old Palais de Justice. You have, of course, the impression uh, that you can see through the walls and you can really see what's going on. But on the other hand, it's not clear anymore who exactly is in charge, because, of course, the customer is king, but are all the users in charge of this building? Like, the real power actually is hidden. So I have a very problematic relation with this kind of transparency. I don't know if people recognize this image. Uh, this is the image of a panopticon. This is basically a, a structure also developed around 1850 uh, to keep prisoners uh, controlled and aligned. So actually with one guard in an, in an obscure tower, he can... Um, control actually all the prisoners. Even if he's not there, prisoners are not sure uh, if there is somebody there or not. So they internalize actually the power and they stay in line. That is actually what happens in some cases of transparency. We think we can see everything, but actually the control becomes invisible. So in some, in some way, this this kind of transparency has to do with overview, with power, with control, but it's very unilateral. It's uh, from one, it's, it's a, it's a one-way street in a way. It's one power organ who controls the masses. And then I started thinking, okay, what, what do I have to say about this? I started looking etymologically. So if we uh, think about uh, transparency, it comes of course from Latin. It's built out of the word trans, uh, which means um, um, an exchange between two parties, two places, two people, and parere. Parere means to appear. So actually it means, transparency means to appear through each other, through the interaction. But then, of course, you need a two-way street. So what I want to develop with you uh, in the next 25 minutes is how we can see transparency as a dynamic exchange, as a two-way street. But first of all, let me introduce uh, Workspace Brussels. Workspace Brussels is a workspace for live arts. Um, we look for different ways to exchange with an audience, and live art is the most broad term that I could find. So it's not stage art, it's not performance, it's not dance. These are all more subcategories. I try to keep it as open as possible. So we use the term live arts. What is a workspace? A workspace is a space for research and development. If you, you know research and development more from the commercial sector, probably. And so in big companies, you have a research and development sector for new, small uh, incubations and, and experiments. If you see the whole uh, artistic sector as one big organization, the workspaces are basically the kind of place where you can do small research that has not really a practical output yet, but that you believe is very relevant. That is basically a workspace. And we are a very intermediate organization. That means we have no own uh, building. We are not uh, an institute. We don't have an own uh, accommodation. We work actually with five partners in Brussels. Uh, like Burschauburg, uh, Kai Theater, Rosas, Le Brigitine, and Ultima Ves. These are all art centers, theaters, and dance companies. And we use their infrastructure. That means they program uh, rehearsals and presentations, but sometimes their infrastructure is empty. And we can use their studios to give it to younger artists for their research and development. So this is a picture of workspace. It's a bit shady. So we are, uh, our, our office is, is uh, located in a house next to the Kai Studios in the Onze Lieve Vrouw van Vaakstraat, which is uh, one of the two theaters of uh, Kai Theater. Then 
Rosas is a partner. This is the big uh, dance company, an international renowned dance company by Andresa de Keersmaker. Uh, Le Brigitin is a, um, uh, from the French community in Brussels. It's an art center for movement uh, next to Garde la Chapelle. Ultima Ves is uh, situated in Molenbeek and is the dance company of uh, Wim van de Kebus. And of course, Beurschelburg, uh, I think it doesn't need any introduction. Voilà, so this is a bit the constellation of workspace. What does the workspace do? In, in, instead of uh, a presentation venue like Beurschelburg or Kai Theater, we really focus on the complete uh, artist trajectory. Uh, on the complete artist practice. That means not only presentation and production, also the writing of dossiers, the development of a network, really the, um, the development of the artistic practice in general. So we're not only uh, product oriented, but also process oriented. We work with artists, let's say 50, 60 artists a year, and we work with them on long-term trajectory. So that means for a year, for two years, sometimes even longer. Uh, and these people, they come on a residency, they get um, technical coaching, content feedback. We, we see how we can expand their network and we really co-produce with them. We guide their research and their, the productions that come out of it. Workspace used to be um, a workspace that was really disciplinary focused, that was focused on dance. Nowadays, uh, because we focus more on the artistic practices, um, also the output of the workspace becomes much more hybrid. So we don't make only dance productions anymore, we still do this, but we also make visual art installations um, and very hybrid uh, mixtures in between. Audio work, visual art, I mentioned already, design, textile design and um, architecture projects. And we work much more than before with artists with various backgrounds uh, who make these hybrid art forms. So before we worked more with people coming out of dance and they all had a similar background. Now I try to open up the artists that work in workspace so their backgrounds can really inspire each other. So we have people with an architectural background, we have people who come from visual art, and uh, they work around similar topics, but of course they have different networks, different expertise. So when they meet, they have a lot to offer, and what you get out of it is of course a big um, process of hybridization. Of course, what does that all mean? Let's uh, make it concrete and let's go into some uh, practices. This is uh, one of the artists that works with us, Christian Bakalov. He's a guy who comes really from classical ballet uh, in Bulgaria. He worked a long time in Paris in the classical dance circuit. And uh, later on, he worked more as a performance in the works of uh, Jan Fabre, Miet Warlop, more in the hybrid performance uh, work. And only recently, he started making his own work. He's a, he's a guy of 45 but he had uh, insanely um, uh, innovative ideas. And he's an artist that I already work with uh, for two years. I work more or less two years in workspace now. So what did he make? He made a parkour installation called Bright. What is Bright? Basically, this guy walks on the street and he finds all kinds of um, uh, junk, basically, like uh, left objects and junk. He collects them into his studio and he builds uh, huge installations with it, but he paints them with phosphorescent paint. He builds a huge installation, like it's really spaces, corridors full with this kind of junk. Uh, but then of course, when you turn the light off, it becomes like an enchanted universe. This is not the only thing. Uh, as an audience, you are invited to participate in this parkour one by one, but you're also immersed physically. So first of all, you're given like a headset, uh, earplugs and uh, a blindfold. And you have to wait like and you, you listen to some waiting music like in an airport for five or ten minutes. Then you are gathered into a next room and uh, you are put very gently out of balance. So people touch you. First one hand, two hand, but on the mean hand, I, you're blind. Eh? So one hand touches you, another one, but then three, four, five. And people start very gently uh, putting you out of balance, even turning you, uh, carrying you, turning you around. So you really lose your grip on the, um, on the environment around yourself. 
And then you're being uh, guided into this installation. And when they take off your blindfold, it's really like the, the impact of the space uh, is immense. So here you can see a part of the um, uh, preparation of the audience. And then this, of course, yeah, it's even harder when it's projected. Here you can see a bit, a glimpse of the inside. People just uh, take their time in the parkour. They, they walk one on one and uh, audience and uh, there are no performers. So audience are participatory, they're participators, but also uh, performers for each other because you meet other people in the dark and for you, of course, they are performers. Another project that we, present, that we presented recently here on the Car Free Sunday is called Perisphere. Uh, this is a project by Benjamin van der Walle, who also probably many of you know. He's a Brussels-based dancer, he comes from parts, but he started to make uh, a lot of installation work. This is a work, uh, it's basically a huge periscope, eh? that's the, the device that's built into uh, submarines to look uh, on a higher surface. So there are mirrors inside. But uh, so as an audience, it's also a one-on-one -on -one installation. You lie down on the bed, you look up, and there are several mirrors inside that can really choreograph your gaze. But because there are several mirrors, he can really put your gaze very high in the sky and he can even pull it way beyond the ground. And so what happens is that he basically films the environment where you're in. This was filmed just here outside uh, next to the Beurs. So you get a very cinematic view on your, uh, on your environment. Um, and your gaze is basically uh, handled as a camera. So it feels, ve it feels very virtual, it feels like a movie, but you know that everything is going on real time uh, in the place where you are here and now. This is also a work. Um, yeah, it's, it's indefinable. Is this visual art? Is this, it's very visual, of course. Is this performance? Yes, it has a live aspect, but there's even no performer anymore. The performer becomes basically the environment because what you see is, is the environment and uh, the artist himself, he is basically a technician who runs, who runs the installation. So the, the projects become very yeah, hybrid. A, a third project that I uh, would like to present to you is Roel Heremans, Duet A. This is a, a young artist who went to the Ritz uh, Art School here in, uh, in the Rue d'Ansart also. And he made imagi uh, imagination choreog choreographies. So basically, uh, two by two, you are guided into this installation. And a voice uh, speaks to you and asks you to imagine certain things. But it, it asks you to imagine uh, personal memories. It asks you to imagine... Uh, a certain story that is being told to you and at some moments it asks you to open your eyes and also uh, think about the environment. Uh, another project is Nico Hafkenscheid's Siden. Nico Hafkenscheid is also a very multidisciplinary artist. He makes music, he's basically an anthropologist, um, he plays in uh, performances, but he also makes installation work. And this is a collaboration with Pablo Castilla, a Spanish photographer. And they did a project about the um, paradox of tourism. So basically since the 60s, many people from the north, northern European countries settled themselves in the south because it, the climate is so nice, because the nature is so beautiful. But of course, the more people uh, settle themselves there, the more that nature gets disturbed. So this was a friction they worked, worked upon. So they went there and they did interviews with many of the people uh, there who were settlers from the north. And they asked them uh, basic questions like, why are you uh, living here? What attracts you in this place? And they got 500 pages of movingly naive answers like, because the sun is always shining here, because the fish, the fish is so good, because the children can play outside. And then they took pictures of the environment and they created this installation, which is basically a book. It's a Blanco book with only some sentences of the, of the interviews. And then the images are projected above it. So if you turn the pages, the image stays the same as like a, a record that is stuck, but the sentences change. This is also, of course, you uh, determine how the pages are turned. So it's a live interactive installation. It's also a, document, it's also a documentary on a certain um, topic. So it's a very hybrid um, artwork. Here you see it set up in a space. And this is uh, the topic that I would like to um, uh, talk about. 
this is what I noticed the last two years when we started merging all these disciplines more and more. When, when you create more encounters at the two sides of the transparent curtain, it generates reflection because it really generates questions about the disciplines or the categories you, you think uh, from. The nice thing about these hybrid art forms is also that they uh, invite you to experiment with different contexts, different networks and different audiences. What does that mean? Uh, these, um, in contrary to like uh, big uh, black box shows, who, which you can all only present in theaters, these more small scale works, these hybrid works, you can really start experimenting with different audiences and different contexts. So we show them in museum, we show them on the street, we show them in parks, we show them in schools, and we can really uh, set up a dialogue, a confrontation with different kinds of audiences. Because the feedback when you, when you create this kind of work, the feedback of, the, of these different audiences is very uh, different. So it's very interesting for an artist to get these different perspectives on the work. I will show you some pictures. So this is uh, uh, during our festival in June. And so during the year, we, we, we organize residencies. And twice a year, uh, we organize a festival to basically come out with the works that we've been uh, working on. This was uh, last June in Beurschauburg. So we do black box presentations. Uh, but on the same time, in front of Beurschauburg, we worked around uh, the topic of football as an art form. And we had a football choreography and a football match where artists designed basically the uh, promotional panels and uh, t-shirts. Because at that time we had the UEFA Cup, so we really wanted to dialogue with the football audience to get outsiders in. So uh, that was what we did in Beurschauburg. In the same festival we went to a park, to Park Farm. I hope many of you know this place, it's an amazing place uh, just uh, behind Tour and Taxi. And uh, there we presented some performances. This is a performance by Hoosie Vervloesem, who made basically a labyrinth in the bushes uh, where you could uh, learn more about this plant. And there we encounter uh, more, uh, like in Beurschauburg, of course, we have more uh, a cultural audience. In the park, it was a, a neighborhood activity that we actually participated in, so we didn't organize it ourselves. So there we encountered a whole different audience, more uh, a very diverse, cultural diverse neighborhood audience. And we also did a festival in an empty factory in a totally different part of town. This is Ken Kairi van der Eyck and it's an old metal shop in Ixel. Uh, some of you may know it. And this gave us a chance to also really mix these different uh, ways of uh, presenting and these different art forms with each other. So we had one-on-one -on -one performances where you could basically draw a story that was written to you. Uh, we had um, a dance performance by Rodrigo Sobarzo, an installation dance performance. Uh, but also an exhibition in the same building. Uh, we can organize lectures at the same time. Uh, of course, there's also food and a lot of uh, platform for audience to, to meet. So at this, also in these festivals, we try to attract people from visual art, people from social organizations, people from very different backgrounds, also to get um, this dialogue started. This is a presentation we did in the MUCA with the same work that I presented to you, Rul Heremans. This is also a presentation in the MUCA. So this is more the, the high art institute uh, of the visual art. This is another presentation in schools. Uh, it's, a, it's a work by Peter Aars. He's the one sitting in the middle. It's a conversational piece about the future where he talked with the students and uh, people from outside uh, the school about the future. Uh, this to give you an overview of the different contexts, the different works, and the different audiences, the different artists that we really try to uh, bring into contact, because this, the last two years, really became a bit of the core business of uh, workspace, or at least a very important perspective. Now we go to the future. So uh, Les Alpes saint gerry you all know, it's very close by, it's there. Now in December, we will create a, a pop-up gallery there. Uh, during the Christmas market. So this is a, a new initiative, basically to open up to this dynamic in Brussels of the Christmas market. Probably many of you are also very skeptical about it. It's a highly commerce, uh, commercial and also loud uh, initiative. But of course, we can exclude ourselves from it and nag about it, or we can also try to, to, to dialogue with it, 
participate in it and actually try to change it from within or from within this dialogue. So what we will do, we launched uh, a few days ago a, a, a massive call to all the art schools, uh, to the artists in Brussels from all different levels, so students, emerging artists and even big names, and we will make a huge collective exhibition in Les Alles saint -Gerie that will take place for three weeks in December, and all the artworks will also be sellable, will also be sold. So it's a kind of alternative Christmas market, but then with content. So this is also um, a way of, yeah, in which we try to dialogue with the city, with different audiences in different formats. This is the, the poster image. So it's a creative Christmas market. If there are artists among you, um, please check the call. And if you have nice proposals, I'm really looking forward to, to see them and to check them. Uh, and in the future, we will also work the next festival in March will be in collaboration with Reciclar, which is a totally different organization. It's a very neighborhood oriented organization uh, who has mainly a very strong music programmation. And they have also a very mixed audience, French and uh, Flemish and very international, a real Brussels audience. So by migrating through all these contexts, we can really have the maximum of dialogue with the diversity of the city. And next year we will also do uh, a project on the Venice Art Biennale, of course not in the official programmation, but still in the same context, just to give you an idea of yeah, the very different uh, contexts these kind of works are able to, to generate. The point that I try to make with this maybe uh, long explanation is that once you start to uh, work with these artists and you really give them also a, a space, to develop their voice, everything mutually influences each other. And this is the point that I, I this is how I would like to see transparency. So as opposed to this very uh, one way street of the control who tries to uh, basically keep the status quo and the persons in power, uh, they just want to keep things as they are. Um, if you look at transparency as a two-way street, the nice thing is that all the persons or all the venues involved actually dialogue with each other, but also influence each other. So what you get is actually innovation and what you get is actually creativity. So thanks to dealing with all these audiences, the artists get different feedback. They develop their work in a different way. If, they've, if they develop their work in a different way, I also, or we in Workspace, also have to work differently with them. Uh, for example, uh, we used to organize mainly studio uh, residencies. That, mean, that means we give you an isolated studio space for two, three weeks, and you can rehearse your piece. When it's, fin when it's, when it's finished, you bring it out into the world. Now, since many of these works are participatory, I don't need so many studio residencies anymore. We rather uh, organize contextual residencies. What does that mean, contextual residencies? I actually look for a context, like the park, like the museum, like a school, where you can already pitch your work and you can develop it through this dialogue, through this participation. So it's not isolated anymore. It's much more in a, continuous, a part of a continuous process. Well, this brings us to In Praise of Waves. Uh, the beautiful, the, the core of this um, exhibition, also this started from a dialogue. I never planned it. It was never like a concept or an idea. It came out of a dialogue with uh, a friend, a curator, who was uh, Luc Lambrecht and Cissé Strombeek. He was going to organize a Japan exhibition, and he asked, can you uh, tip us a Japanese artist? And I started making a list. And then I realized, wow, we have like 15, 16, 17 artists in workspace that or have Japanese roots or uh, work around Japanese topics. And they all make super nice work. So I said, okay, look, here, here's a list. And he chose only one. And then I thought, oh, that's just a pity because we have so nice uh, artists and artworks. So I proposed to him, let's make a duo exhibition. And uh, I will focus on the younger emerging artists. You focus, focus on the more uh, like established names. And uh, we'll communicate together. And then uh, we found out that also Beaux-Arts and saint Contenaire were organizing Jap Japanese exhibitions. So we made actually uh, a platform for our uh, shared communication. I'll quickly show you some pictures. What the core is of this um, 
exhibition and of the um, Japanese influence between East and West. So it's not only Japanese art, it's really art uh, by European artists inspired by Japan or by Japanese artists inspired by Europe is dealing with the unpredictable. So it's also opening yourself up for a dialogue, not to have unilateral control, but really allow yourself uh, to deal with the unpredictable. So it's letting go of control. Uh, we made sand sculptures. Uh, this was basically, here you see a line of sand falling from, uh, from a box who is just outside the image, which creates a landscape that is totally unpredictable. Um, this is a meeting space, it's like a tori, which is a, a classical, uh, normally two-dimensional Japanese gate. But um, this artist made a three-dimensional version of it, so you could really have a merging point in between. That's Hans van Wambeke. I will not go into all the work. Uh, this was a very nice origami mobile that we made. Um, no, but I want to make a point. I want to make one point. Um, because it all should lead to something. So if I take you back to the beginning, uh, transparency sometimes is interpreted by, uh, by this uh, unilateral urge for control. How I try to redefine it or how I would like to look at it is uh, transparency as a place where opposites can meet, not in a static unilateral way, but in a dynamic exchange. For that, we need willingness to let go of control and to question ourselves. But the nice thing is that thanks to this questioning of yourself, something can really come up out of this uh, and you can get creative with it. So it generates reflection. So transparency is also linked to reflection. If you allow the reflection to come up, you get basically an outsider perspective on yourself. You can question yourself and only then you can grow. So we have the unilateral transparency which is aimed for static conservation and we have the uh, bilateral transparency which is actually the core ingredient for creativity and to grow uh, and then transparency becomes a process where you become apparent through interaction and then we are close to the etymological word of transparere that's the point that i would like to make thank you